this is a little an introduction unlike uh, many that we've done. So just hang in here with me. Here we go. She now serves as executive director of the Unity Urban Ministry Ministerial School, where she was a graduate and is a member of the Unity World Headquarters Board of Directors. And the, she's also, in addition to that, that sounds like one job all by itself. In, in addition, she's the minister, uh, associate minister at Unity Temple in the Plaza, and she does all those things. Look at all that. Uh, that's that's another job all by itself. I, I'm amazed. And then, okay, and if that wasn't enough, there's more. Mm -hmm. She worked 42 years in the federal government and retired as a manager at the FAA. And she's, uh, we've actually seen her do this at some point, the reenactment of the life of Bessie Coleman. And that was uh, on PBS, uh, on almost every station in the United States. She's got workshops on diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, babysit. Oh, she's got all kinds of stuff. How to care for your, your elderly parent. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's all those awards there uh, from the Daughters of American Revolution and uh, the Mosley Award, Outstanding Leadership in Urban Ministry. So there, there's one more thing. She is a Kansas City person, uh, Phil, and she live in Lee's Summit, and her mother moved in with them. She turned 100 this year, and Sandra is primary caregiver. They have two kids and four grandchildren. And wow, Sandra, I'm tired just talking about all that. <laughs> so uh, Sandra wants to start with something that's kind of fun. So... Uh, if you all, hopefully this will just go, stand up and listen to this. Oh, there we go.
Wow. Is everybody sitting down now? Everybody dancing? For <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, if you want to make sure you have a good view of Sandra as she speaks, uh, click on speaker view. And Sandra, take it away. All right. Didn't that just get you excited? My good friend, Reverend Juan de Harrell, is the Associate Minister of Unity of the Bay in uh, Miami. And he had his ministerial team send that out on the Unity Minister's Facebook page and I went berserk. I was like, can we have that? I have been begging our choir director since COVID to put something like this together, but they say it is a monumental task. I don't know how they did that in Florida, but that is powerful and it should be all over unity. The other one they've done, they sent me is oh happy day. So I don't know if I sent that to you, Jeff, but I will. You guys Look, might want to use did. that. I, I chose this one. Oh, good. I, this is the perfect one. But if you want to use it, they said use it. And all they ask is that if you have a like to give them a love offering, uh, you might do that. And their information is at the bottom of that, uh, the, the credits on the screen. But I'm just excited that we have this kind of love energy in unity, aren't you? So I, I always like to start off with my special prayer. Lord, fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough. So if I happen to lunge forward, my computer screen falls apart, you'll know that God has pushed me and said, okay, Sandra, enough said. Because I tend to pack a lot of information. Uh, Christine Garvey at Unity Temple always tells me, Sandra, you had three talks in that one talk the other day. So. So I apologize if I'm too verbose, but I always have so many ideas and things to share. It's amazing when I come up with a talk, how emails or someone in passing at a grocery store says something, that's how it comes to me. Or in the middle of the night, or I wake up in the morning and there's this idea and it just grows and grows. So I keep a running tally of lesson ideas in my iPad notes. And I, and I, you know, I end up with songs and scriptures and all kinds of things that relate to that lesson. And that's how, how I do it. That's, it's that simple. Something may be going on in our lives, like right now with COVID, the pandemic, or, or with the upcoming election that inspires me that I need to share something. So last week I shared how to vote for God. And if any of you watched the, uh, you happen to be, see the service or you watched it on, on YouTube from Unity Temple, uh, I gave Eric, I read Eric Butterworth's uh, essay, I guess it was, I'm guessing it was around 1960, that there was a very tumultuous election going on. And Eric Butterworth wrote this, either, it was either a, a Sunday talk, I don't really know. The date that he referred to as election day was Tuesday, November 8th. So with the help of Mark Hicks, uh, we, we looked at all the, the uh, elections since the 1800s. And we looked at all those that occurred on November 8th. And I think because of the timing, it had to have been the election where President, where you know, the John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon were competing for the, the White House for presidency. And it was tumultuous because nobody, I won't say nobody, but a lot of people thought if we get a Catholic as president, we're going to hell in a handbasket. We get a Catholic as president, the Pope's going to be running the country. And there was all this misinformation and disinformation uh, because just because John F. Kennedy was a Catholic, right? And so there was a lot of uh, angst, uh, much like what we're going through today, about who should do this and who should do that. And I think, you know, the, the best person won. I think John Kennedy, that was in my generation. I was young then, you know, I was in elementary school, probably getting ready to start junior high. And I was just coming aware, becoming aware of the political arena and, and social issues and that sort of thing. So I, I, I'm glad I shared that because I think it helps us to put things in the right frame of reference when it comes to whose side you're on. There's one side and that's God's side and, and God and good will win out. So today I wanna to talk to you about live well, laugh often and love much. And I just thought put a little love in your heart from Unity on the Bay was perfect for that. I taught Sunday school in Unity for probably 30 years. 20 of those years were at Unity Temple on the Plaza and a couple of those years were at Unity of Baltimore when my husband was stationed in the Marine Corps detachment at Aberdeen Proving Ground and I worked for the army at that time. And when I was teaching Sunday school, the, the thing I liked most was it reminded me of when I was in Sunday school. 
I love stories. And I love the stories of, you know, from the beginning, I love the stories of Jesus teachings. And, you know, I just love stories. And I think that also inspired me to become a storyteller. So I, I like to start off with something funny from Sunday school. Um, the teacher was teaching the story of Adam and Eve to a, to a group of very little children, elementary age, maybe first and second grade. And after the story, she always had them draw a picture. And so she asked the kids to draw a picture of that story. And when she looked at little Johnny's picture, she was quite confused. There was a car and there was a driver and there were two people in the back seat. And she asked Johnny, how, do, what does this have to, how does this relate? You know, how do you see this as about the story? You know, what about the story did, made you draw this picture? And he said, oh, uh, the driver is God and the passengers are Adam and Eve, and he's driving them out of the Garden of Eden. So, <laughs> you know, as remember Art Linkletter said, kids say the darndest things, and they teach us a lot of lessons. In the past few Sundays, Duke and I have been talking about choices and how our choices create our consequences. And Duke shared some statistics on choices that I hadn't heard before. Do you know that the average person makes 15,000 choices a day? That equates to 900 choices per hour and 15 choices per minute. Now that's a busy mind, you know, and all of us have busy minds. And sometimes those choices lead to unfortunate circumstances if we make the wrong choices. The fortunate thing is most of the choices are involuntary. There are things that we don't pay attention to. Breathing, for example. It's an involuntary thing. We don't have to choose to breathe or not to breathe. Blinking, if we still have our taste buds and we can still smell, those are involuntary choices. But the voluntary choices are the ones that sometimes lead to consequences that are good or consequences that are not so good. So I wanna to talk to you about our voluntary choices. Sometimes we choose to dwell in the past. That's a choice, that's a choice. And dwelling in the past keeps us stuck. Sometimes we choose to only think about what ifs and you know, what's gonna happen next. What if this happens? What if that happens? What, what if something doesn't happen the way we want it to after November 3rd? Well, that's trying to think into the future. We have no control over that. That's a voluntary choice can, that can lead to negative consequences because if you don't get what you want, then you're stuck in a mindset that's angry and vindictive or depressed or anxious. And Jesus said, be not anxious about anything. Don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what tomorrow will bring. Because the birds of the air and the lilies of the field don't worry. Why should we, when we're cared for even more so by our one all powerful everything God? There's a plaque on my uh, living room table. And after I did this talk, <laughs> I realized it was right in front of me. And the plaque, and, and in fact, uh, I think Jeff introduced this, or Mickey did in the email that went out with the uh, Zoom link. And the plaque is attributed to, em to either Emerson or someone, but it's on my successory, you remember those successories were real popular back in the day and you'd have big plaques and, and wall hangings. Well, this one is successful is the person who has lived well, laughed often and loved much, who has gained the respect of children, who leaves the world better than they found it, who has never lacked appreciation for the earth's beauty, who never fails to look for the best in others or to give the best of themselves. So if you fit any of those categories, and I'm sure you do, or you wouldn't be here, you're successful. No matter what the outside circumstances may tell you, you are a successful person because you live well, you laugh often, and you love much. I was inspired to do this talk by some recent transitions. One of those many of you knew, you knew her well, and that's Bobby Blankenship. When I got a phone call from Joyce Lockridge, asking me if I would visit with Bobby over the phone as she was in the hospital. I immediately picked up the phone and called, but I didn't get an answer. So I waited another day and I called 
and I got her daughter, Nikki. And Bobby was home and Nikki was caring for her. And she had hospice there and she knew that the time was coming close. Bobby had asked if I would do her eulogy, which really, you know, made me humble, you know, that she would ask me to do her eulogy. And so I had prepared to do that, but because of COVID, I knew I wasn't going to go to the temple because I have my mother who is 103 months. So she was, she turned 100 in August. So I felt guilty that I wasn't going to be able to deliver on a promise. And I thought about it and I, and I prayed about it and I went into meditation and spirit led me to record a tribute. Well, that tribute couldn't be played because the, the system at the temple went down. There had been a, uh, a power outage and it took a while for it to reboot. And by the time of the service, it wasn't up and running so they couldn't get the projector to run. But the, our, our wonderful team at Unity Temple sent, sent it out on um, DVDs, I think, or they sent it out on, um, on the worldwide net and they were able to share it with family and friends. Bobby inspired this and I'm dedicating this service to her. She inspired this because when I talked to Nikki about how Bobby lived her life, to get some ideas on what I would share, because services like that are not for the dead. They have lived their life. As scripture tells us, they have fought their fight. They have run their race. They have stayed their course. They have kept their faith. What I learned from Nikki was Bobby had an amazing faith. She loved unity. She loved people. She loved having fun. So I gathered that she lived well, laughed often, and loved much. She inspired me. The week after Bobby made her transition, I got word that a very close friend made his transition. He had been like a big brother to me for many years. He and my brother, best friends, and uh, Hank Hasley was also our tax accountant. And I, I sat in a Zoom uh, memorial service. As long as I'd known Hank, there were things about Hank that I was overwhelmed listening to that he had done for other people. He was always so very nice and good to us, but some of the things that he did, he had Agent Orange. He was in the jungles in Vietnam. And in his latter years, and he was only in his early seventies, uh, the disease became worse. But Hank lived his life to the fullest and he lived well, loved often and laughed much. He would, we would laugh so much during the times when he'd be doing our taxes, we would forget what we were there for. We'd be there for hours. And Phil and I would leave going, we've, we've been here a whole day <laughs> because you couldn't sit with Hank and not have fun and not talk and laugh. Bishop Barbara King, one of the first black ministers who came indirectly from Unity. If you know anything about Johnny Coleman, you know that she was one of the first ministers, black ministers, Unity ordained. And there was a big disconnect because there was some uh, systemic racism in Unity at the time. Barbara, when she came to Unity, uh, had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Her mother had been stacking up these daily words at Barbara's, uh, Barbara was a school teacher, in her, in her living room. And Barbara never read them. And when she got the news about her disease, she, her knee, she was just distraught and, and just walking back and forth in the room and her knee bumped into the coffee table and these books went tumbling onto the floor. And for the first time she picked up one of those books and she began to read and whatever she read inspired her. And she called her mother and she says, Wait, how long have you been sending me these books? And her mother says, I've been hoping you would pick one up. And she told her mother about her diagnosis and her mother said, you need to go there. You need to pack up and go to Unity Village, go there. And so she did. And she enrolled, but she wasn't able to live on the campus. She wasn't able to eat in the cafeteria and she wasn't able to swim in the swimming pool. Ruth Mosley in whose footsteps I followed was, had to sit outside the classroom some years after Johnny Coleman was ordained. Johnny separated from Unity and started the Universal Foundation for Better Living in Chicago. Christ Unity Temple in Chicago, Christ Universal Temple in Chicago, which had about 4,000 congregants, a school for K through 12, probably one of the largest, uh, I would say one, maybe the largest religious 
spiritual based school and community by run by a black woman and founded by a black woman in, in all of North America. Johnny was a very flamboyant person. She came in a limousine. Uh, Duke talks about how when Unity had a reconciliation with Johnny, about 2005, I believe, when they pulled Johnny in and said, we're sorry. And there was, a, you know, these were people who had nothing to do with what had happened, but they recognized that something went wrong. And uh, Johnny and, and Unity reunited. She drove up to Unity Temple in a limo, I'm told. She was a phenomenal individual. She passed away in 2014. I believe she was 94. Barbara King made her transition. She was in her 90s, I think, last two weeks ago, three weeks ago. She was a bishop, graduated from Johnny Coleman's Theological Seminary. Jim Blake, the CEO of Unity World Headquarters, just graduated and is being ordained by the Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. These people live well, love often. They live well, they laugh often, and they love much. Johnny had an amazing sense of humor, much like Hank and and Bobby. So I shared all that to say that we don't wait until it's time to leave this world to start living. The time to start living is the present moment. Now, you can't relive the past. If it didn't go the way you wanted it to go, you can't go back there. Let it go. And you can't move into the future. There is no fast forward button you can push on life. There's no rewind button you can push on life. Although I've had some experiences where I wish I could have hit the rewind button and I'm sure you have too. But the only time we have is now and it's the present. I mentioned second Timothy because usually in, in the services I've attended, memorial services and home going celebrations that we have in the churches that I come from, Somehow that gets recited, you know, 2 Timothy 4, 6, I have fought the good fight, I have run my race, I have finished my course, I have kept my faith. Well, the time to, to record that is not after you're gone. The time to practice that is the present. Run your race. You know, a lot of times we spend time trying to run somebody else's race, run their business, right? Run your race, stay your course. Fight your fight, live in the moment. And I'm talking to you, but I'm actually reading my own mail right now. Live in the moment. So in John 10, 10, one of the scriptures I thought really emphasizes this point, Jesus is speaking. A thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. So when I was a kid growing up and I heard the scripture, I thought, well, where's the, who's the thief? You know, I was always looking for who's this thief that's coming to steal and kill and destroy. And it wasn't until I got into unity and learned the metaphysical interpretation of these words that I understood that the thief is in here. Everything starts in the mind first. I still kill and destroy my own abundant life by my negative thinking those choices that I make that have unfortunate consequences. Now, some things we have no control over, right? But in Unity, we learn one of our principles is that it is our thinking that creates our reality. Now, the experience and the reality are two different things. But what you think about the experience is what's important. It's not what happens, it's what you think about it. Do you call it good? or do you call it bad? It's up to you, that's a choice. That's a choice. You've probably heard the, the poem, two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. That's a choice. We can choose how we see things. We may not be able to choose what those things are, but we can choose how we relate to them, how we respond to those. I think it was, I'm trying to remember who said this. I want to say it might have been Socrates, but I'm not sure who said, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Yeah. So Jesus was referring to how we create our experiences when we choose certain thoughts. 
you know, your thoughts come and go. I mean, we have busy minds. 15,000 thoughts per day is a lot. 900 per hour, 15 per minute. That's a lot of thinking going on, but it's what you hold on to, what you latch on to. So you can have these thoughts, but you don't have to invite them for dinner. Okay, so you just say, cancel, cancel, cancel. When that thought comes that you don't want the consequences of that thought, cancel, delete, delete, delete. Whatever word you need to use, let that thought go. You don't resist the thought. You just don't allow it to take up camp in your mind, right? So we can choose how we think. An abundant life that Jesus was talking about has to do with our thoughts. You may not have all the wealth in the world that you would like to have. You may not have the best place to live. You may not have the, the perfect car to drive. There may be things in your life that you feel are lacking, but it's how you think about that that creates the abundance. There are people who have very little and they're wealthy. There are people who have very a whole lot and they're poor. That's what the Beatitudes mean when it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Meaning you let go of the ego. You let go of the ego. That's poor in spirit. You don't, you don't have a, a richness within your own, I am the greatest, or I have, you know, I, I, I don't have this or I don't have that. Your richness comes from that positive thinking about who you are. The apostle Paul, who went through a lot of changes, he he changed, he was transformed from a hateful, mean, vindictive. Christian hater or followers of the way at the time, those who followed Jesus after his death, after the resurrection, he, he, was, he was a bounty hunter. That was his job and he was paid well and he was one of the best bounty hunters. He was known for that. He was revered for that, picking up Christians and taking them to be tried and persecuted. That's what he lived for. And then he had an epiphany that changed his life. And he became one of the people he persecuted. He became one of the followers of the way because he had a transformation. And he tells us in Philippians how to go about this way of changing our, our thoughts, making the right mental choices. This is what he has to say in Philippians 4, 8. He's talking to the, the people in Philippi. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, when life is happening to you, it's kind of hard to think on these things, right? You're thinking about what's happening right now or what didn't happen yesterday or how you're not going to be able to do something tomorrow instead of staying in the present moment and focusing on whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is of good report, whatever is right, whatever is admirable. It takes work. And one of the best ways that we can learn to do that is meditation. Going into the silence and really listening to God speak to you and tell you what is yours to do in this situation. If you haven't cast your ballot, that may happen Tuesday. It may happen on Wednesday. If your concern is the outcome of our upcoming election, you need to go turn within to God and you will know exactly how to respond, not react, but how to respond to the outcome of the election and turn it into abundance for your highest good. Live well, live well. We have a choice. How about laughing often? You know, I love humor. I love to laugh. And my mom at a hundred can tell some of the funniest jokes I mean, she just, they just roll off her tongue uh, because growing up, my grandfather was quite a jokester and I got to spend a lot of time with grandpa in Arkansas in that little dirt town with that little small house with the Gary on it where we'd sit and he'd tell me stories. And I've always had this admir admiration for people with a sense of humor and people who can make me laugh. Maya Angelou said she doesn't trust anybody who can't make her, she didn't trust anybody who couldn't make her laugh. I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that's why I fell in love with my husband. The first date we went on, talking about laughing often, we didn't, we hadn't known each other very well. He was a young Marine and I worked here. He was stationed here at the Marine Corps Finance Center and I worked uh, for General Services Administration. And uh, 
Phil takes me to the movies. And he had just drank some uh, pop and he belched. And he said, I am never taking you anywhere again. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> People kind of turned and looked at me, you know, and I was so embarrassed, because, but I found out he has a sense of humor, you know, and he, and, and, and that's been ongoing. I mean, we laugh a lot around here. And sometimes when I'm gonna do a, a talk and I tell him my joke, he won't laugh at all until he sees I'm not looking and then he cracks up. I, I think he doesn't want me to get too cocky. I don't know what it is, but he tries to make me think I'm not that funny. You might think I'm not that funny too, but I do like to laugh. So when I think about laugh often, I think about this joke, Father O'Malley answers the phone. He says, hello. The, the other person says, hello, is this Father O'Malley? He says, yes. He says, this is the IRS. Can you help us? He says, I can. Do you know a Ted Houlihan? I do. Is he a member of your congregation? He is. Did he donate $10,000 to the church? He will. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to try that. That might get you some more revenue. Just get the IRS you know, involved. <laughs> and don't lie on your taxes. So laughter is an amazing spiritual gift, isn't it? Doesn't it just kind of bring you, just like dancing to that song earlier and listening to good music, laughter just kind of has a healing effect. And we need to do it more often. We need to do it more often. I remember hearing a speaker once say that laughter makes you skinny. And he looked around the audience and he said, some of y'all haven't been laughing very much. And so, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so laughter is good for the soul. It really is. If something isn't going right in your in your life, turn on something funny. I love to watch, you know, the the comedies on TV. You know that I I like Mike and Molly. I like you know I want something that lifts my spirits. You know because there's so many other things that don't lift our spirits. Thank you, Lynn. That was Shakespeare and it was Hamlet. Thank you for I couldn't remember Socrates or whatever. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Thank you, Lynn. Um. Laughter helps us cope with sadness too. So when you have a homegoing celebration for someone, think of something funny that they said or that they did. We'll remind you that they want you to be happy. They want you to laugh. And they don't mind you being a little skinny because you've been laughing so much. Proverbs 7.22 says, a merry heart does, a good like, does good like a medicine. You know, the Bible is, tells us everything we need to know if we look for it. There is, there is something, advice on some of everything in that textbook that we use in unity. And you remember the trials and tribulations of Job? You know, Job would not give up. He would not, he refused to give in to, to this, all these things that had happened, lost his family. He lost, I mean, they died. He, he had sores. He lost his, he was wealthy. He was a very wealthy, everything was gone, but he refused to give up. That's, that goes back to second, second Timothy. That's referring to Job. I have fought the good fight. I have run my race. I've stayed my course. I have kept my faith. And no matter how many times he was tempted to give up his faith, he did not. So no matter what goes on in your life, you can hold on to your faith and know that the good will win. You know, maybe that's what Michael Jackson was, was referring to about Job when he's saying, let me fill your heart with joy and laughter. Togetherness is all I'm after. Where there is love, I'll be there. You know, let me fill your heart with joy and laughter. Find somebody who can make you laugh. If you're not married and you're looking for a spouse, make sure it's somebody that can make you laugh. Make sure it's somebody that can make you laugh. Charles Dickens said, if we couldn't laugh, we would all go insane. And I believe that's the truth. Sometimes we have to laugh to keep from crying, don't we? Laughter is the best medicine. And you know, Jesus had a sense of humor. You know, you're gonna tell somebody, don't criticize somebody else for the speck in their eye and you got a big two by four sticking out of yours. I mean, what a visual, how funny is that, you know? You got this big two by four or the scripture that tells us it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you don't know anything about world culture, and world history, you might not know that there was a place called the eye of the needle. 
in Jerusalem. It was in the marketplace and it was a small, you know, like passageway. And when the rich people would come with all their wares to sell and they would have them all packed on their camel, that camel was loaded down and couldn't get through this passageway called the eye of the needle. And some say that that has to do, that the eye of the needle is a rope. It's, it's actually to do with a rope and, and a sort of like thread. So there are different interpretations. But my young brain heard that in Bible school and when I was a kid and I could picture my mother sewed, she made quilts like the one you see back here all by hand. She never owned a sewing machine. She didn't know how to operate one. You cannot see a stitch because that's how she, she grew up making quilts, right? The whole family did. So the needle has a time, you know how to thread, how hard it is to thread a needle as you become older. I mean, yeah. it's like, my God, you know, I used to be able to just thread the needle very quickly. Now it takes forever to thread a needle. I'm licking the thread and I'm doing this. And so, you know, imagine trying to get a camel through a, a, the eye of a needle. That's kind of funny, isn't it? It's a funny expression. But what, is, what it says metaphysically is all the wealth in the world cannot make you happy. All the wealth in the world, the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of happiness, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom within you is innately joy. And you can't get there by buying things and having stuff. And some of us do get a lot of stuff and we're trying to fill a void thinking that that will make us happy. But that's another one of those humorous stories from scripture that has a, a real a real positive meaning for us, a real lesson for us. So let me talk about, we talked about live well, laugh often, love much. I can summarize that real quickly with 1 Corinthians. I know you know that. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love is not envious or boastful. Love is not rude or egotistical. Love is not provoked. Love does not think ill of itself or others. Love does not rejoice in another's frailties. Love is not fearful. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love never fails. Of all the spiritual gifts, love is the greatest of all. I think Jimi Hendrix said it best when he said, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. The world will know peace. So God gave us these gifts. These are the gifts of life, to live well. God gave us the gift of life, it's up to us to live it. Laughter is healing. Mark Twain said the human race has only, has one really effective weapon and that is laughter. Laugh in the face of somebody who's, who's being not nice to you and they don't know what to do. They, they, you, you, you put them off. You know, smile or laugh. So laugh often. And then love. There is no power on earth greater than love. Dr. King said, love is the only force capable of turning an enemy into a friend. So laugh, live well because death is before you. You can't avoid it. We're not going to get out of here alive. Laugh often because life's not to be taken too seriously. And sometimes we take it too seriously. Love much because God is inside you and love is ahead of you. So I wanna summarize with this, going back to choices. Every day you have a choice. You can choose to be happy. You can choose to be grateful. You can choose to be satisfied with what you have. You can choose to be thankful. So this is your life. No one can live it for you. Choose wisely how you live it. Live well, laugh often, and love much. I love all of you. Thank you. Sandra, uh, once again, absolutely amazing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, was this something about um, 
the, the irony of Agent Orange, that you were there at the Aberdeen Proving Ground and your friend uh, uh, was stricken with what, uh, what the cancer or the- Yeah, the he, he had- he had he he had a uh, an oxygen tank that he just in the past oh, I'd say five years uh, he could not go anywhere with that and he did not he showed up at his at his office he ran a tax business every day with that oxygen tank always with a sense of humor but finally it just overtook him he had uh, cancer of the lungs oh. he had ingested that um, the the uh, insecticide that they were spraying the jungles with that many of our young people who served in the jungles in Vietnam experience. I, uh, I, as a teenager, went there to protest the war in Vietnam. At Aberdeen? At Aberdeen, yeah. I lived, well, in Baltimore, so it's a yeah. quick ride up there. Yeah, well, we were there from 75 to 78. Uh, that's a little after my time, but yeah. that it was, um, I was there. I was doing all that in the late '60s, early '70s. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, it, all those wonderful quotes, and uh, the fact that it's a choice is wonderful for us to continue, uh, especially given what's about the the choice of reacting that we're going to have to do in a week or so. Bye. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, so there's, uh, I'd like to get back to the PowerPoint for just a second. And uh, if I go here and share, there we go. Um, that should go away in a second, I hope. I just need to move. Hold on, I'll stop the share and start again. <laughs> all right, screen. I can identify, I go through this all the time. Uh, yes, uh, it's crazy. I don't. Uh, you have to go into wherever you pulled this up from and exit out. Uh, I, you know, I just did that. <laughs> oh. It doesn't want to go away. It doesn't. It wants to stay right there. Wait. Oh, no. It's going to play that again. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Uh, stop share. Uh, I think I can get at it this way. Is it in your Chrome? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's not quite it. OK, but good. There we go. Uh, So uh, one thing that I know you like to do and see is this.